Hallelujah. So if you have your Bibles today, we're going to go straight into the word. Ephesians chapter four will be the chapter that we begin at today. And um, I pray that uh, that you are impacted today. I believe that you will be. It's a blessing to see all of you that has decided to come be with us today. And uh, I hope that this moment is a moment that God can brand something on your life to change your destiny. Ephesians four, Ephesians four. And we'll begin today uh, at verse 11. And once you uh, get there, you can just signify to me by saying amen. Ephesians 4, 11. Um, this is part five of the campaign, the conquest, and the occupying. And um, this has really materialized and uh, into something just m beautiful. Uh, not that I did not know that this was going to be a great series, but of course, it's kind of like being in the midst of the game. And, uh, you know, you hit certain, uh, 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 certain energy spots. And, you know, if you're running back, if you whatever, after you hit these zones. And when you hit these zones, you begin to perform in ways that you didn't know you can perform. And I think that we're hitting zones. We're hitting spiritual zones that, 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 that God is doing something beyond our mental comprehension. And I'm um, really excited about it. Really excited about it. Um, hallelujah. I believe that this, this series right here will materialize into a book. I really do. Um, God has just been dealing with me about a whole lot of stuff. Anyway, all right, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation and uh, just bring you guys up to speed. We're dealing with the campaign, the conquest, and the occupy. All right, in Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastors and teachers. Uh, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do this work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Verse 13 says, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. So um, we're picking up at the part of, uh, of this series of understanding what it means to buy into the vision. Buy into the vision. Buy into God's vision. There are many visions that are being cast in the earth concerning a lot of things. And a lot of those uh, uh, different visions has the way to come into us, and, and they're toxic. You know, it's kind of like uh, we can function, we can, we, be, we can be born in a certain group of people, a people group. We can be born as an African-American or a Caucasian or a Hispanic or whatever your race may be. There are different mindsets within people groups. There are different mindsets within cultures, and, and we develop uh, different ways of functionings that are birthed out of uh, the type of environment that we live in. And so we begin to live our life based upon how we was raised according to what, what, what uh, 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 the people we live around thought versus to what God say. So from a religious standpoint or a um, being a Christian, you know, it, it, it's real easy to understand how many people in the earth has been indoctrinated with wrong stuff. It's because everybody is not teaching what the words say from the book. Some people are teaching what they have embraced or, uh, 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 or been exposed to traditionally. Some people teach tradition, but they teach tradition with no true origin, which is the word of God. And you ask them, why do you do that? And they can't really tell you, but grandma did it or grandpa did it. And if grandpa or grandma was alive, they'll tell you that grand, great granddaddy did it or great grandma did it. But you'll find out that there's a contradiction between what they say, what they do versus what's written. And so as believers, we want to go back to the book. We want to go back to the book. But in order for us to legitimately go back to the book, we need to 
uh, 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 be, be, be clear and be real with yourself to say that, that there is a great possibility that we are functioning in a way that's not biblical as believers. All right? We have to come to that place. You know, some of us, we're like, we're, 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 we're so full of our religion to where when God tried to make spiritual adjustments with us, we reject God. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus came. Jesus didn't look like what they thought he would look like. Matter of fact, if they really studied the book, the way they say they studied the book, they would have saw Jesus when he came in because the book spoke about him coming. The book said how he would come. The book said that he would be born of a virgin. The book said that he, he would, he, there are certain things about Jesus' life that are, were to the T that was written in the letter. But these guys that studied the law, they were blinded by the spirit of religion, so they did not recognize Messiah when he showed up. So just like today, the Lord, the Lord by his spirit, is making spiritual adjustments among his people, and the first thing that happened is that we get on the defense mode. You know, we, we get offended because it's like, it, it's not something that we are familiar with. It's not something that we're, we're used to. So that's the reason it's very important for you to follow along with me in the word so you can fact check me. Fact check me. Make sure I'm teaching the word. Make sure the word that I'm teaching is in context. Make sure it's in line. You know, your job is not just to believe what I say. Your job is to search the scripture and follow with me with the hope that you'll find everlasting life in it. Now, you've met Christ who is everlasting life, but we need the full invasion of what's in the realm of the spirit everlasting to invade us in our natural now so that when the world see us, we can be legitimate representatives of this God that we serve. Amen. So, we're binding to God's vision. I established in Genesis 1, verse 28, the whole dynamic that God wants man to walk in dominion. God put us in the earth so that we can walk in dominion. Not one or two of us, but all of us. It's not limited to one or two people. It's for all of us. The word dominion in the Hebrew is to rule and reign. To rule and reign in the earth. To come out of this, this poverty subculture that has affected us so bad to where we we, we have be, begin to we are spiritually crippled and we live out uh, or, or we express the crippled state of our spiritual life but we have to come to the place to where you say you know what I'm not flourishing like I'm supposed to be flourishing you know I'm not the tree that I'm supposed to be you know I know that there's something greater in me I know that there's something greater for me but the Word of God has the ability by the Holy Spirit to unveil what has been hidden. I hope we're not speaking above you here today. I pray that it's landing into your heart. So, the deal is here is that the Apostle Paul told the church at Ephesus here, he said, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Right? See, this is a whole other message right here. These are the gifts which Christ gave to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastors and the teachers. Now, most people, most people in the, in the body of Christ or the church realm don't treat pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers as gifts. Most people treat the office like we're hired servants. Matter, matter of fact, some people look at the office in a lesser view than what God intended to be looked at. If you, as a people, knew how important this fivefold ministry was, you would change your life, your way of demonstration, and your verbal expression towards what God has set in the earth to be a blessing to you. It's kind of like the same thing with a husband and a wife. If you really know what the benefit of a wife is or the benefit of a husband is, according to what God said, it will change the way you treat your mate. But many of us don't understand the true value of what a husband is or what a wife is. It's not, you know, just your bedroom partner. 
It's beyond that. It's more spiritual than anything. And when the man understands his role, it changes the whole dynamic of how the house functions. So these are gifts. They're gifts from God. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So we got a lot of people that's wearing a lot of titles that's not fulfilling the mandate. We have a lot of people that are wearing these, title, wearing these titles, but they're not functioning within the confines of what God said that their responsibility is. Church has become uh, 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 theatrics. It's theater. It's Hollywood. It's smoke and mirrors. It's what the people want versus what God wants for the people. And so we got a problem when we got the preachers or the leaders being puppeted by the people because now the voice of the people become the dominant voice in the person that was supposed to be a gift to the people and the people are getting what the people had spoken into the leader to speak to them. It's a problem. The greatest voice in my life should be God. And so when God speaks to me, Contrary to what you believe, my job is to communicate it to you and the Holy Spirit responsibility is to confirm that it's God. We got to get this thing right. We, we have a spiritual backup. We really do. It's kind of like somebody that's like in their digestive system that they have an impactment and can't nothing go through is because something is stopping up the drain. That's where we are spiritually right now. Instead of throwing up, instead, instead of digesting, we throw up. Not understanding what you've eaten has the ability to affect your whole body. So our job is to build up the church, pastors, leaders. Your job is to build up the church, not tear it down. Your job is to build God's people up, not tear it down. It says, and this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be, be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So my job, one of my jobs is, is that my job is to help you grow up. My job is not to give you a pacify your whole life. My job is not to feed you milk your whole life. The Apostle Paul said that the church at Corinth, that they sucked on milk too long. Because milk will bring you into spiritual, spiritually deficiency. There comes a time in your life that you need strong meat. You need some good strong protein to help you to stand up and be strong. If you look at the dichotomy of how milk is made up, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, the most potent uh, mineral in milk is calcium. Calcium. And calcium is a structure-building mineral. So when we talk about structure, we talk about the bones. But you need your bones to be strong because when you put some meat on the bones, you need the bones to be able to hold the meat up. And right now we are spiritually parverish and we can't stand up because we're trying to add layers of meat with no structure. And so God got to strip us down like the bones were stripped down in the valley that Ezekiel prophesied to. It was a need for those bones to be stripped down because the bones had to be strong. And when the structure is strong, then it can stand up. And then you can add weight to it. Because you can't put weight on frail bones. The Lord is speaking. So my job is to help you to be complete. My job is to help you to grow up, to be mature. Verse 14 here, the Apostle Paul says here, he says, then we will no longer be immature. He's talking about spiritually. He said no longer will we act like spiritual infants. He says here, he says, we won't be tossed and blown about 
by every wind of new teaching. Now, I just got to back this up for a second. So he says, no longer will you and I be immature. No longer will you be a spiritual infant. And then he switched gears and he moves into another realm. And he says, spiritual infants give heed to new teachings and they toss to and fro. Now, that, that's not a misinterpretation of what I just said. But you got to understand how scripture works. So he spots like spiritual infancy. And the first thing he says about a marker of those coming out of spiritual infancy is that they won't be tossed to and fro. So if we're being tossed to and fro, that means that we still in infant stage. But sometimes you've been in the church a long time and you don't want to acknowledge you're not as spiritually mature as you should be. You know, you may have made it to the 12th grade, but you lost the, you, you didn't get the principles, a uh, uh, foundation of mathematics. And now you're in 12th grade like Dexter Manley, and then you go to Louisiana Tech somewhere, and then you get drafted to the Raiders, and you don't even know how to sign a check. Dexter Manley used to play football for the Raiders. I mean, the uh, Redskins. He didn't even know how to write. Didn't know how to read and write. Graduated from high school, went to college, went through college. One of the greatest defensive linemen that ever played in the league. Bally knew how to write his name. How did that happen? Because his talent caused him to be promoted when he shouldn't have been promoted. And he went through the world deficient. He was able to function in a world uh, uh, in an abnormal state. He didn't even know how to read and write. And that's how we are spiritually sometimes. We get in the midst of the pack of people that are spiritually mature and we fake it. And we hope that they don't bring up certain topics. Because those certain topics may expose how deficient we are. But don't feel bad about that. That's a good thing. Because when it get exposed, I hope you get embarrassed enough to go to your prayer room and let the Lord train you. If I'm ever in somebody's presence and they're speaking spiritual language, and they talk above my sphere of understanding, the next time they see me, I will have the ups on them. Let me say that again. If I'm speaking to someone that their range of understanding is higher than mine, for as a spiritual, any, anything, but definitely spiritually, I may tell them I don't understand that. Because I'm not afraid to say what I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not drunk with myself. I'm not intoxicated with, you know, I know everything. There's so much I don't know. But what I do know, I'm sure of. So if they begin to talk to me about something that's out of my range of thinking, my job is that, yeah, there may be a level of shame there, especially if it's like infant stuff I should have known. I'm going to run to Google. I'm going to run to the Bible, and we're going to study so the next time they see me, I'll be able to talk to them about whatever they want to talk about. So I hope that those moments of embarrassment that we all may come to, that it push us further into a, a dive deeper into a, a wanting to know more about God and wanting to know more about whatever is being discussed. That's how you become an individual that can talk about anything. Amen. That's a good tool for you. You know, that's a good tool for you. Don't walk off and you don't know and you don't go check it out. Somebody come to me talking to me about Islam. I got a book about Islam. You know, I start looking to see what the Quran say. You know, I can't stand up and make a legitimate argument against something that I don't understand. You know, people come talking to me about politics. I need to know how government works. Not just I'm a Democrat or Republican, and I don't like him because he got bad language, and I don't like her because she's a crook. Let's talk about the real issues. Same thing spiritually. When things arise in your life and people bring spiritual matters to you, you should be able, the Bible said, you should be able to give an answer. That's what the Word says in Colossians. It said you, as a believer, should be able to give an answer. And if you don't have an answer, thank God for Google. Thank God for text message. Thank God for telephone. Because I'll call whoever and say, what do you think about this? Amen. So, so, so the apostle Paul says that, uh, he said, no longer will we be immature like children. We won't be tossed to and fro. We won't be tossed and blown. That's what it says in the New Living Translation about 
every wind of new teaching, teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. So now he says that lies has the ability to sound true. Samuel told Pastor Shonda here a few days ago, he was talking about Santa Claus, and uh, somebody told him Santa Claus wasn't real, and he said it's not true. He is real. And she say, who told you that? He say, my mind. Our four-year-old. A day or two later, the conversation comes up again. He said, Santa Claus, not real. She say, who told you that? She, she asked me, she said, did you talk to him about Santa? I say, no. It was his mind again. <laughs> telling him that Santa wasn't real. And so now the truth bearers have to come in because the world has painted a picture so beautiful that it would make anybody believe that Santa possibly can be real. But I thank God that we're raising up thinkers. Because here's Seth. And Seth said, there's no way he can be real. Because everywhere we see him, he's a different person. I'm telling you, these boys are sharp. Yeah, yeah, you better, you better make sure you tell the truth. See, everywhere we go, Santa is different. He can't be real. And here Stephen goes back to the origin where he used to be real, but he couldn't do all that stuff. And this is a conversation between a 7-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 4-year-old. So thank God we're raising up fine minds. I remember I, had a, I heard a message that Bishop Tudor was teaching year, a while back, and he said that God blessed Abraham because God knew he can trust Abraham, meaning that God trusts Abraham to train his seed. So this morning I was standing there, with Sammy, and I looked down, he was on that phone. You know, I hate that phone, man. I hate it. He was on that phone because it was helping him be sociable. You know, he was able, he was able to be sociable and function in an environment that didn't distract everybody. But all of a sudden, I said, you know what? I can do this. I say, put the phone down because Regus is going to train his kids. You know, this is how I'm thinking in the midst of worship. I'm thinking about I got to get in touch with God, but I got to start the process of bringing him to God with me. Isaac did not come the mortal sacrificer without Abraham being a legitimate example of what it meant to sacrifice. One of Isaac's most memorable moments is when he and his daddy went to worship God and they didn't take a sacrifice. And he's seen how serious his father was about sacrifice because he ended up on the altar. And the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham because there was a ram in the bush, but the intensity and the seriousness of sacrifice was sown into the heart of Isaac forever. So what are you doing that's being sown into the heart of your children? That's a memory. We were in a restaurant one day. I got up to go to this buffet uh, feeding area, and uh, this little uh, Hispanic girl was joking. She was standing, she had turned blue. Everybody was passing out around her, you know, mama, everybody. But wasn't nobody touching her. This girl was just choking like at the buffet. So it just so happened God had got me up to walk to the buffet to go get a refill on food. And I walked up to this girl, and I did the Heimlich maneuver. All of a sudden, she unstopped from choking. Everybody was like, oh, you know, everybody's like, went crazy, you know. The girl was back breathing again. So I went back, and I sat down in my chair. And all my kids, that was my audience, they was waiting for me to get back. And I gave the story. And uh, I think they might have saw it on the, uh, the circuit deal, like the camera they had up in the area. Uh, but, but the story was about how Daddy saved this girl's life by the Heimlich maneuver. But they saw me pray for people in the name of Jesus and stuff. Turn around. Those are markers on my kids. Those are markers. So now when we go place, I don't just pray. I say pray with me. Lay hands with me. Because we're training a generation. We're training a generation. Somebody say, Lord, I will train. 
the next generation. So, 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 so the apostle Paul says, he says that don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Now, the, the, the new international version, which I rarely quote from, says in verse 14, it says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. All right, here's a lesson. It's new for me. So when he used the verbiage of, of, of don't be like a wave, tossed to and fro by the wind, all right, most of us, what is a wave? If somebody say, ask you a question, what is a wave, what would you say? Water. A wave is not water. A wave is not water. It's like, wow, because I thought it was water too. A wave is energy that is passing through individual particles that's pushing it into a certain direction. It's like, wow. So when is the origin of this push? The earth tilts on its axis. We're heated. In a 24, we, we, we pass in front of the sun on a 24-hour cycle. When, when heat is on one side, cool is on the other. When, air, when, when things get hot, uh, heat rises. When heat rises, things expand. When, 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 when molecules expand, cool air comes in. And it creates this cycle of what we call wind. And wind, which is energy, begin to blow. And the wind begin to blow. And it hits the water. And the energy, which is wind, cause the water to move. What's well, a good scientific lesson right there. And this is true. This is true. So, so, so when, when God showed me this deal about the wind be it being the agent that moves the water, the question is, what move you and I spiritually? Paul said every wind of doctrine. So that means that there is energy that's flowing against you and I through information that has the ability to negatively affect us. So we need to figure out how we counteract that. We're still selling the vision right now. We're still selling the vision. All right, so if this is true, which, is it, which it is, Colossians 2, 7 says, let your roots grow. Let your, let your roots grow into him. Who is him? Jesus. All right? Let your lives be built on him. Who is him? Jesus. All right? Who is him? Who is him? Jesus. Let, let your roots grow. All right? Let them grow down. Roots should not grow up. Roots should grow down. Why does roots grow down? Anybody? It has to do with foundation, but when roots grow down, roots have the ability to sustain the weight of the tree as the tree go up. Structure, bones, skin, flesh. All right. So if we're growing up and the roots are growing down, which is the nutrient, where the nutrients go, where all the important ingredients to keep you a healthy tree go, because you can't grow up if you don't grow down. So the body of Christ, we've not grown the way we should grow is because our roots are messed up. So some stuff got to be uprooted. That's what God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1. He said that your words are to root out, cut down, throw down. Because there's some stuff that has caused us to religiously be rooted that need to be uprooted. That's the reason that was a motto when Jesus came. He looked at the fig tree. He said, hey, I'm hungry. Or was it really about food? It had to do about obedience because the tree had a responsibility to produce figs because the Savior was there and he needed to eat. He said, I tell you what, I'm not going to let you hang around any more tree. This is Jesus speaking to the tree. I'm not going to let you hang around anymore, tree. And the Bible said he cursed the tree from where? He cursed it at the root because he didn't want the tree to hang around anymore. So the roots had to be uprooted and killed. So, so 
So you cannot have an image of a tree, but no productivity. So we got trees in the body of Christ that ain't producing nothing. We have trees in the body of Christ that are not producing anything. They become spiritually sterile. They're still here. They're still standing, but they're spiritually sterile. They're not able to produce because the Lord Jesus talks about fruit. He talks about trees bearing fruit. And he said, I don't want you to just bear fruit, but I want your fruit that you bear to remain. But you got to be a healthy tree to bear good fruit. Well, we're not getting many amens today. Maybe it's deep. Maybe it's deep. It's deep thinking. So he said, I want you to, 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 to be rooted, grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong. Then your faith. Then, once your roots are growing down, now it's time to build and put nutrients into the roots so you can grow strong. But a lot of times, God starts the operating process, and we jump off the table because we feel like the surgery is over. Instead of being still and allowing the Lord to minister to you spiritually so that you can be changed, you can be healed, you can be delivered. Because there are some things that happen in your childhood that need to be exposed to you by the Spirit so you can be healed. There are some things that have happened to you when you was in high school that damaged you so bad that God needs to go into the internal of who you are and heal you. Because if you're not healed, you ain't healthy. And we got a bunch of people that's in the body that are not healed, so they're not healthy trees. But we have to be willing to come clean and say, you know what, I got issues. I have issues. You might not drink. You might not, you might not be a drunkard. Let me not say drink, because some people can drink a beer. You know, I wouldn't drink nothing but water. And I'm not encouraging anybody to drink anything because those are gateways into a dark place. And I can attest for that from me to my family. But let me tell you something. Don't mean that you're a drunkard. Don't mean that you're walking around here smoking cannabis sativa, new ports or whatever you're smoking. Because some of us, we smoke in religion. Amen. Because it's, it's affecting your mind. And it's doing more damage to you than cannabis sativa will. Because now you are spiritually impaired. You can't function. Your vision has been messed up. And so we have to get to the place to where we deal with the real us. We're still talking about campaigning. This is a part of vision. Because you can't go in and take something that you're not completely convinced about. So you have to go inside of you, and, and you got the little boy, and you got to be healed. The little girl, and you got to be healed. But you're going to walk forward, and you're going to be productive in, in, in society, and you got you, you injured inside. You need to be healed. That's what's wrong with the body right now. we got a bunch of leaders and a bunch of preachers that are hurt. They're wounded. They need to be healed, and they spew this stuff all over people. Because somebody done them wrong. I had a lot of people done me wrong. But you know what? I let them all go. And the reason I can let them all go is because the people that birthed me hurt me first. And if I can let them go, I can let you go. Uh, you ain't got to say nothing. I'm speaking out of real freedom. You know, my dad abandoned me. He abandoned me. Only met my father. I've been saved 16 years. I met my father for the first time in my life in 2001. The month of March 2001. He abandoned me my whole life. I was hurt. I was wounded. But when I got saved, I was able to release that and forgive him. So if I can forgive the one that gave birth to me and hurt me, surely I can forgive you. I'm going to walk around here with problems with people. I'm going to let them have problems with themselves. I'm not going to take you to bed with me. Those thoughts I had a pastor tell me one time, he said, quit taking those people to bed with you. You lay down, you talk about them. You wake up, you talk. Just let them go. Just let them go. Don't, even, don't let it be pillar talk for you and your mate anymore. Just let it go. Talk about the sun. Talk about your great sport team or whatever. You know, don't take all these people's problem to bed, man. Because now their problems infiltrate your dreams. 
and you're impacted by them because of all their negativity. It's the energy. It's the wave that's causing you to be unstable. See, we look at it from one angle when it's really not what we look at. It's your issues that can manipulate and control you. Satan is a strategist. He's not walking around with horns and a red tail and a black coat with black fingernails and pale skin saying, I'm the devil. The brother ride in on thoughts. He ride in on accusations. He ride in on people that don't want to speak to you anymore. He ride in on people that unfriend you on Facebook and you need to go back and friend them and then reclassify them. I've reclassified a lot of people. They don't know it. Don't let the devil use you. Use you against you. Oh, it's real good. You get delivered today because I'm going to tell the truth the way it is. And when you go back and, and refriend them or whatever, let it be pure. Let it be real. Don't let it be something that you're trying to be antagonistic and flaunt something in them. Let it be genuine. Let it be real. So when you see them, you can be so nice to them in the Holy Spirit. You heap coals of fire upon their head. I mean that you bring torment, such a level of torment to them that they're compelled to, be, to run away from you or get converted. So he say, I'm, I'm taking too, well, I'm not taking too much time with this. I'm taking just as enough time I need. Amen. If it take a little bit longer, it take a little bit longer. It's kind of like Stephen went in for eye surgery. They said it's going to be 45 minutes, and it took almost two hours. We didn't want them to bring the boy up off the operating table uh, saying that I gave you a 45-minute window, but it took an hour and a half. No, take as long as you need to. Just bring him out right. And we put pressure on people. We put pressure on people to perform. Let God do what he want to do. If it took you 10 years to be jacked up, it's going to take more than an hour to get you fixed. It says, then your faith will grow strong in the truth. You were taught. So right now, you're being taught. If you go into a church, you're in a ministry, you got a pastor or leader, they're not teaching you, impacting you, training you. You need to find somebody that can teach you. You need to find somebody that can train you. I am not everybody's teacher. I am not everybody's preacher. I am not everybody's pastor. But I am somebody's teacher. I am somebody's pastor. I am somebody's leader. And maybe that somebody is you. Connect, connect, connect. Be impacted. Be changed. So he said, he said, grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Somebody say thankfulness. It's because when you see your deliverance process materialize it, you're going to bust out in praise because you're so thankful that God gave you a gift to be a blessing to your life, to change your mind, to change your physical demonstration because God done something spiritually on the inside of you. You ought to be busting out with praise. It's like, my God, that teaching saved my marriage. My God, that teaching saved my children. My God, that teaching saved me. If you're not being impacted like that, you got two problems. Either the person that's preaching got the problem or you. But if the person that's preaching is preaching the truth, it's you. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. So the roots are very important. I want you to say my roots are very important. All right. So I'm going to take a little time with this just for a minute. My roots are very important. So you and I have an individual responsibility to be rooted in Christ Jesus independently, meaning that outside of anybody else, you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord, most people. All right, you have a responsibility when you connect to Christ to connect to his system of feeding. All right? He has a system of feeding. Okay? For all of you ladies that's had a baby before and all of you dedicated men that took part in the feeding process of that baby, you go understand this. 
For you that have not taken part in that, maybe television taught you and you will understand. I don't know. I'm going to try to explain to you as best I can. All right, so I'm rooted, meaning that I'm planted in Christ, all right? I ain't going anywhere. I'm stable. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I'm not looking at Muhammad. I'm not looking at Buddha because Christ has answered all my issues. I'm not running uh, uh, with Krishna. I'm not running with the New Age movement, uh, 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 worrying about karma or whatever. I'm with Jesus. I'm riding in his car. He's my Lord. What he say is what I do. I don't care well, who, 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 who da 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 whatever, who say whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Everybody can say whatever they want to say because Jesus is all I need. Amen. He's all I need. Now, even though he's all I need, there are things that I need that has not been exposed to me uh, by him. But as I keep walking with him, it's going to come into knowing. Amen. See, see, because you can walk with Jesus and you realize that Christ is so deep, meaning that he's depthless in revelation, that as you walk with him, you'll find out new things about him every day. And every moment is an awe moment. Every moment is a wow moment because revelation, every moment is awe. Because in heaven right now, the Bible says that the angels are uh, uh, encircled around the lamb and every moment they're saying holy so they're saying wow every second wow holy holy wow 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 so all their days in eternity are endless revelations of who God is so when we walk with Jesus there are endless revelations about who Christ is, all right? He's much more than Savior. He's much more than Messiah. He's much more than the Lamb of God. He's much more than the warrior. He's everything. So in the whole capsule of everything, which everything cannot be capsuled because there's no boundaries, we just live in God, we move in God, we have our being in God, and God is, is all around me. So he is all I need. All right, so... I hope you got that. I'm rooted. I'm grounded in him. So you got the baby. The baby is born. All right. The baby normally, normally, all right, normally would get its feeding from the mother. Right. I know there are different circumstances that happen, and it don't really happen because infamil will step in. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, I, see, I know what I'm talking about. We got enough babies, all right? So, so whatever inhibiting factors that hinders the natural process, uh, scientifically, there have been technologies so advanced to substitute, all right, to substitute or supplement, you know, what the mother's breast milk should be doing for the baby, right? Because most times you have a baby, they try to get that baby and put that baby on the woman to latch so the baby can immediately start getting the nurture and the nutrients from that mother's breast because God designed that system. All right? So somebody came up with the invention of what a female, uh, 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 this, all right? A baby bottle, the nip on a bottle, all right? The nip on a bottle It is the mimic, the design that God designed in a woman's female anatomy. Or I'm trying to be very kosher here. So, so this baby has the ability to get a plastic model, all right, of what physically a woman has on her body that was designed by God for this baby to feed off, all right? So either the baby is feeding off mom or the baby is feeding off a bottle or a nipple that was made by man, but it has within the bottle uh, uh, the nutrients that are supply are similar to the nutrients that are supplied through the woman's body that God put within the physical mechanism to produce whatever this baby needs. All right, so why is it we get saved, we get born again, and all of a sudden we say Jesus in two or three places and we, we believe God, but we never come to church anymore. We never read our Bible anymore. We say, yes, Jesus, Jesus is the Savior. I believe you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, that's your last Sunday. All of a sudden, you never show up anymore and you expect to stay healthy. You expect to grow spiritually. You expect, you expect, to, beat the, you expect to beat the devil down. You, you ain't going to beat nothing but you. And you're deceived to think that you can stay out there and survive in that type of situation not being nurtured through God's spiritual system. So the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 23, it tells us clearly in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17, I think it is, it says that God will set pastors after his own heart 
to feed his people so that you may gain understanding and you may be better. All right? So God will always commission an under-shepherd, which is a pastor, to shepherd his people. So we should always find somebody that, that, that bear the image of Christ, teach the word of God, that we connect to so that we can be spiritually healthy. But if your pastor is not spiritually healthy, don't expect you to be spiritually healthy. So you get real good meals here. And for you that stream live, you get real good meals. So, so God is giving you a supplement. Amen. I'll be your internet preacher. Amen. Now, we can go a little deep with that. I'm just going to leave that alone. But the point that I'm making right here is that how are we going to be healthy trees? We're still campaigning right now. You know, the campaign take a little time. We're still campaigning. How are you going to be healthy? How are we going to be healthy trees and we're not being fed spiritually? we got to be planted in the right soil. we got to have nutrients in the soil. You can't show up every now and then. How many of you show up to the dinner table every now and then? I can't wait to get out of here to eat. <laughs> Don't know what I'm going to eat, but I can't wait. Because God designed my body to want food. So even when I'm saying, no, we're not going to eat because we're too chubby, say, oh, yeah, we're going to eat something. You know? And when I drink some celery juice or beets or whatever and they don't satisfy that spot in me, I start looking for some meat because I'm a carnivore, man. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm a carnivore. Give me a, give me a, give me, come on, give me a, 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 something. You know, give me a piece of meat, amen? Give me some cow or something. Hallelujah. All right, let me move on. Ten more minutes, man. I haven't been speaking at all. I'm doing really good. So, we have to be persuaded in the understanding that we cannot stay healthy spiritually if we're not connected to the right system. Don't let anything disconnect you from your healthy system. You do know that the demonic mechanisms that are crafted together, or demonic systems that are crafted together within the earth, I mean, like, like strategically, are put in place to disconnect you from your feeding source. So everything and its mama, or its daddy too, will try to encourage you and I to disconnect from what is healthy, what is feeding you and I healthily. Everything. Guys, are you hearing? So start looking. When stuff starts trying to come pry you apart from what's feeding you, recognize that it's connected to a demonic system. It may not be demonic in its nature, but it's a part of the system to pull you away. And if you get pulled away from the body, you disconnect your feeding source. Guys, these are things that in 2017 we got to start recognizing. We got to start saying, that's not healthy for me. We got to start saying, me even dealing with that person is not spiritually healthy for me. Me hanging out with those people is not spiritually healthy for me because it's not building me to be a healthy tree. Romans 4, Romans 4. I hope you follow me, man. Follow me. Follow me. He'll lead. We'll follow. Romans 4.20. The Bible says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. In this, he brought glory to God. Verse 21 says, he was fully convinced. Somebody say fully. You see, you can't be partially in. <laughs> he said he was fully convinced. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Guys, we got to get to the place to where we don't let the enemy play mind games with us. God is well able to do whatever it is that needs. God is no respecter of person. God can do whatever he needs to do. It's our job to get in agreement with him. Can somebody turn to Genesis 12? Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12. Can you just read verse 1, 2, 3, 4? Genesis 12. 
do we have a speed reader in the house? Genesis chapter 12, the beginning of the book. One, two, three, four. So, so listen, listen, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, 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 but as we're campaigning, here's a pagan, because Abraham was not a man to God right here. His name was Abram. He was not a man to God right here. His family worshiped idols. But something in Abraham, the God gene was in this brother somewhere. And so God spoke out of nothing. Matter of fact, I'm sure none of the other gods ever spoke to him. So when this God spoke, he said, this got to be God. And the first thing God did with Abraham, for all of you that may be a little uncomfortable right now, the first thing he did was detach him from what he was connected to, uh, that was causing him to be spiritually dwarfed and deficient. He told Abraham, hey, get up. You got to leave here. You got to leave here. Get up. You got to leave here. He said, now let me sell you the vision. He said, this is what's going to go down, Abraham. I'm going to take you to a place that you know nothing of. And the ramifications of the blessing that I'm going to release over you is that those that bless you, I'm going to bless them. He began to say, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to make you a great now. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. So God sold this to Abraham. Abraham got up. He got his nephew Lot. He got Sarah. And he headed out. And he moved away from paganism. So the Bible says in Romans 4, which I just read, it says that he was fully persuaded. So how you and I can effectively campaign or sell the vision of God when we have not disconnected from systems that's not of God. We got to disconnect. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you what those things are. We have to disconnect. We have to detach from it and to move forward. So, if we are not convinced, we will never fight for what God tells us. We'll bounce around. We'll shrink when people come tell us stuff. No, it's time for you to stand up and say, ah, I beg to differ, brother. I'm not trying to argue with you, but this is what I believe. Because that's what people that don't believe with God tell you. Anybody ever had somebody that didn't believe in, in the Lord, and all of a sudden you start talking to them, and all of a sudden they got strong about what they believe. Matter of fact, anger showed up, and they're like, well, this is what I believe, brother. This is what I believe, sister. And they get, they get a little aggressive with you. So why is it as a believer we can't stand up for what we believe in? Because sometimes we're we afraid of what people are going to say about us. We're afraid of how they're going to classify us. They, they're going to they're come against us to persecute us verbally. They're going to call you all kind of crazy names. So get ready for it. They're going to say, oh, they're such great people. They're going to say, oh, they think they know it all. You know, they go to church now and they think they better than everybody. It's like, you know, you ought to scratch your head and say, you know what? I know we're doing something right. They're making them type comments, man. I know. We got to be doing something right. They got a problem with me getting saved. They got a problem with me getting set free. They got a problem with me going to church every Sunday. When I was going to the club with them every weekend, they didn't have a problem with it. You know, when I was getting loaded with them, they didn't have a problem with it. When I was going to all their stinking functions, whenever we was all drunk and doing whatever, they didn't have a problem with it. But now I want to get up and smell good, look good, come to the house of God every Sunday, every Thursday, every, every time the door opens. And they got a problem with it. It lets you know that you're doing the right thing. They won't give you a ride to church, but they'll give you a ride to the club. 
We're taking up donations for the church. You want to donate? No. All the church want is money. We're taking up a donation to go buy some absolute vodka. Want to donate? Yes. Who paying for the drinks? It's on me. You baller now. But when it come to God, don't nobody won't do nothing. Come on. So, hey, we got church. Where is that tonight? Oh, I ain't going. We got a party. Where is that tonight? Oh, where is that? It started at 8 o'clock. We ain't going to be able to make it by 8, but I'll be there before it's over. They won't say that about church. So, I don't have time. Church. Guys, you got to start rethinking this stuff because that's the way the world thinks. You used to think like that, and me too. I really did. I didn't have time to go to church. I was living for the world. Somebody come around with a donation. To my mom my mom had pies and stuff, buy a pie, you know, selling stuff. And it's like they always want money for the church. It's like I need money for Bud and Weiser. Because I was fooled that Bud was going to make me wiser. <laughs> Seriously. But I had to get delivered. Man, you spend money on everything, man. You sit at the casino and spend money all night long. You know, you got Lana Rich in your head all night long. You got Lana Richie going on in you, you know. But when it comes to the kingdom, everybody rejected that don't want to walk with God. Guys, we have to mentally recalibrate our thinking. You are a believer. I am a believer. God has called me to a higher level of living. He's called you to live above where you've lived. You and I are the hope for the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Last scripture. Possibly. Jude 1. Jude 1, verse 3. Says in, in, in the New Living Translation, it says, Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation which we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith. Somebody say, I'm going to defend this thing. Defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all times to his holy people. So God has entrusted the, the, the ability of defending the faith in your hands and my hands. Oh my God. So what the Lord did from the beginning is that he put hostility between us and the enemy from the beginning. So our job is that we should be defending the faith. So guess what? If you're going to defend something, that means that you're going to have opposition. So for all of us nice Christians, because we've got a lot of nice Christians, you know, just nice, don't want to do anything. Let me tell you something. I'm going to talk to you real strong right now. If you save, if you walking with God for real, for real. You will have opposition. You will have opposition. Meaning that you're going to have stuff coming against you. Don't think you're doing something wrong. It could be you're doing what's right. When your family start getting silly, your friends start acting up, your coworkers start getting weird, people start acting, just, just be calm. Just go outside like they go take a cigarette break, you go take a prayer break. You just go out there and you just go breathe it in, Jesus, and you just speak in tongues, and you just come back and you get back in the fight. Don't let them derail you. Just, just say, hey, I, I, I'll get back with y'all. Just go sit in your car and put some, don't go put Tupac on, you know, go put Hillsong on. You know, don't do not do that because you'll be wanting to go kill somebody. Just leave. <laughs> hey, we still say we still in church. I'm telling you the truth. Y'all want me to lie to you or tell you the truth? You can't make me lie. You know, well, well you might, it might not be Tupac for you. I don't know who it is because I don't know who all singing right now. I know there's somebody named Drake. I don't know what he do, what he sang or whatever. I just saw his name somewhere. You know, I've been out so long. I'm like, I, I'm still with Dr. Dre and him and. You know, Eminem, I think he's still around. And, and Snoop Dogg, you know, he, he's changed clothes now. He need to get saved, you know. 
I mean, like, who would ever thought that Snoop Dogg would be on TV rapping with, uh, what's the name that went to jail that sold them cakes? Martha Stewart. <laughs> you know? It's like, man, who ever thought this, you know? The brother went from uh, slinging about, sl uh, singing about, you know, slinging drugs and, 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 and popping homie, and, and tonight he's singing all the jingle bells. You know, God bless him. You know, I'm glad he didn't left that alone. Hopefully, I don't know. I just, they all need to get saved. Anyway, God bless Snoop. Because Snoop ain't walking here. We need Snoop. God, come bring your money, Snoop, and help us advance the kingdom. You don't believe he walk in? Because guess what? Snoop was eating dinner around the corner. Dinner's around the corner of my house. So we that close. So Snoop, come on. If you, if you accidentally bump us on Ustream, Snoop, God bless you. We righteous and we're holy. We believed in redemption. And, and God will bless you, Snoop. And God will deliver you like he delivered me. We're not going to sugarcoat the gospel. Yeah. Think I'm going to change my message? Snoop will be here cracking. Oh, he's telling the truth, you know. <laughs> Listen, 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 guys. We have to be fully persuaded. We cannot straddle the fence, all right? You may get scratched up a little bit as you're going through the briars. God never said we wouldn't get scratched. You may sit there and cry and say, I don't know why they're attacking me. You need to change that confession. You do know why. You save, and you defend in the kingdom. So get out of your little depressive hole and stand up and say, I'm going to cry, Jesus, but I'm going to do it. You, you know, you'd be like Whoopi Goldberg on Color Purple, you know. <laughs> be like over with all my life I had to fight. You know, I mean, you just went back. You just, you just, you just went back. You just lost. Man, what's happening here, Lord? You just went, you just lost it. But you pull yourself together. You know, I mean, time I had to take stands with tears coming out of my eyes, literally. But the end result was beautiful. It was beautiful. Guys, listen, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stop. I don't want to stop. I'm having fun. I really am. People getting changed. You can have fun while we do this. You, you know what I'm saying? What what greater thing can we be doing? You know, because outside of the anointing, uh, outside of the anointing, I'm not funny. Not like this. I don't think I am. I don't know. But God is doing whatever needs to be done for you right now. We're selling the vision right now. You know, you, you say, you know, people come say, you know, it's like, you know, you come to some of these places and I'm not talking about it. But you go to some of these places called ministries or church or whatever. And it's like going into the funeral home. It's like a corpse. It's like, you know, ugh, you leave out of there like trying to get it off you, you know. Seriously. I mean, you come up in here, it's life up in here. It's life up in here. It's life up in here. It's really, it's life. You know, we can breathe up in here, you know. You know, you don't have to go to the club to come alive because you come alive like that. It ain't the right type of coming alive, you know. And the Lord won't change us all. And so today I petition you in this series that we're doing, campaigning. We're campaigning for his vision, his vision of multiplication, not financially multiplying, but multiplying for his discipleship is concerned. Make a commitment that you're going to disciple somebody this year. Make a commitment that you're going to seed into somebody's life. Now, when you're discipling people, you're going to have to have the, uh, 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 the gift of long-suffering. Because that is a gift. Long, you're going to long, you're gonna have to long suffer. You're going to have to have all the temperaments that's needed over in Galatians somewhere. I think it's like nine of them or something like that. You're going to need all of them. Because when you disciple people, they're going to be boneheaded. They're going to do stuff they shouldn't do. They're going to disappoint you, but you're going to encourage them. I'm talking about real discipleship. It's kind of like your kids do some. You're discipling your kids. You know, you discipline. You get on them, but you encourage them too. Heidi got a whooping yesterday, which is like every day, but she got a whooping yesterday <laughs> by her mom. So I know she, that she had, she had broke the, uh, that the cup had already filled over, you know, because her mama whooped it, and I knew that the cup was just overflowing. It was overflowing. Because I was like, I tell tell Pastor John to whoop her, uh, spank her, or, or, or whoop her, because we say whoop her, but spank her to be pro proper. You know, I say, uh, you know, how do you need a spanking? But I say whooping. I'm just for proper. Okay. How do you need a spanking? Uh, she need a whooping, whoop her, you know. 
And uh, her mama just go on and go on and go on, you know. And Heidi, the cup has to spill over. So when Heidi started getting a whooping yesterday, the cup had already spilled over. I knew it. So anyway, after she got whooped, I got in on the whooping too, you know. Because I spanked her because, you know, I just popped her because she was trying to get away from her mama. Because it's like a hard situation trying to spank her, you know. And I was like, you know, just get up here. I hit her on the butt, you know. And, uh, and I'm just letting you into my home right now so you can see this. So, so, you know, we went on through the day, and uh, for people that didn't know it, she got here, she had an attitude, she didn't want to do her drama or whatever, but I saw her getting over it, you know, she was able to do her dramatics, her drama for the play. And so, uh, long story short, uh, this is Heidi. No matter what has happened, no matter how she's got discipline, no matter how, what type of ruckus it was, because sometimes it's a ruckus, you know, we're trying to deal with a 10-year-old that's strong, and she's trying to get away, it's like, no, stand still, we're going to hit you on your bottom, we don't smack people in the mouth, we don't hit people in the head, you know, they got a, you know, backside. So anyway, long story short, this is Heidi. Uh, can you come here? Can, just walk for me, Steve. And give me five minutes. Just walk. You're me. I'm Heidi. And Heidi walks up. I said, I love you, Dad. I said, I love you too, Heidi. And she walks off. She's smiling. She's happy. Because Heidi knows that it's not abuse. She knows that it's discipline. She knows that it's correction. But she knows her parents love her. So as you are discipling people this year, guess what? They need to know that you love them. They need to know that you care about them. They need to see that hand that you've extended to help them to be better. Now, as people grow, as far as adults are concerned, when they don't know who their spiritual parents are, when they don't know who they're really connected to, you know, they'll run off because they're, 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 they're still looking for their identity. Those are prodigals, and one day they're going to wake up in the hog pen. They're going to realize, say, what happened here? I need to go back where I used to be because it was good there. I moved ahead of what God was doing. So be gracious with people, but be gracious, but also stand in a spirit of correction. Don't let people mud drug you. Don't let them walk over you, all right? Don't let anybody walk over you. You stand your ground for Christ. You're not standing your ground trying to be hard-nosed and hard like gangster. You're standing your ground for Jesus. God bless him. He good. Listen, guys. Listen. Listen. You stand your ground for Jesus. You stand your ground for Jesus in love. You let them know where you are, and you let them make that decision. I've had to draw a line in the sand many a times. I let people know where I was, where I stood, what I believed in. They choose to go the other way. But I'm still standing here waiting for them to come back. So when I see that son or that daughter coming across the horizon and they're beginning to get near to the place where they're supposed to be, I'm going to get excited. So you don't get mad because I'm going to tell everybody, hey, go kill the fatty calf. I'm going to tell her, hey, go, go get everybody together because we're going to have a real party here. See, that's the spirit of a father right there. I'm not going to say, oh, watch him, kill him as he's coming. Because that's the way some of us, we, some of us, man, like, what? The church is the only organization that will kill that. Well, no, we got some other people now. But the church, the church, the church is an organization that will kill their own. Like Mary Magdalene, you know, it was the church standing there waiting to kill that girl, and half of them was guilty. And Jesus said, you that be without sin, you be the first one cast a stone. Instead of being in the mode of, of lifting people up, don't stone everybody to death. So when they're coming, get excited. Don't say, oh, they ain't real. You don't know. This might be the real time. Oh, they don't want to live for God. This may be the moment. You don't know. This may be the moment that they really want to come and live for God. You would hope, but if they backslide again, you just pray them back again. Let's stand. Can you come, brother? Let's stand. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I hope you guys were blessed. Come on, give the Lord praise, y'all. I know I didn't scream and rub back and all this. I just got to flow where God is because God is in this place. Maybe I did scream at you a little bit today. I don't know. It's that energy. It's the wave. It's the wave. So my prayer for all of you that are here today, this is my prayer for you, is that every area of your life that God has revealed to you, even you that are streaming live by the way of the World Wide Web, every area of your life that the Spirit of God has revealed to you that you are spiritually deficient, 
I pray that you take that area and you lay it on the altar. You will never be able to overcome your deficiencies without God. You can put forth physical effort to try to have victory, but it won't last. Because the only thing that's going to last is what God has done in you and me and what God is doing through us. Don't fake yourself out like you don't have problems because we all do. I got a ton of problems, you know. We all have internal issues that we battle with, individual. And the, for the person that say they don't, they lie. They deceive. You don't have to take all your stuff and put it on Facebook, who book, whatever, YouTube. Whatever. It don't, you don't have to put your business there. You know where your business need to be? Your business need to be on the altar. Your spiritual deficiencies need to be on the altar. And when you lay them on the altar, you lay on the altar with them. And you say, Lord, bind me to the altar with cords. Because guess what? We have to get to the place to where we live a life that's on the altar. Because that's where the fire is. The fire is on the altar. When you have these moments, we call them hiccup moments. You know, these hiccup moments to where we have setbacks in life. You don't run away from God. You run to God. Because when you know who your daddy is, like Heidi, the story about Heidi, when you know who your daddy is, you know that he has a lap that you could run up and sit in. You know that he has a shoulder that you can come lay on. Because that's what a true father is. Just like you mothers. Every mother here, every mother here, if your child come to you, it doesn't matter what your child done, you're going to have open arms for that child. Same, same thing with the Lord. The Lord have open arms for his children. But you know what God is looking for more than anything? God is looking for sons and daughters in the earth. We have to eliminate it. Maybe in 2017, our teacher is teaching the bastard spirit. We got to deal with the bastard spirit. We're not spiritual bastards. We're sons. We're daughters. We're not birthed out of illegitimacy. We birthed out of a true union. The Holy Spirit has caused us to, to stand, and we know who our father is. We don't even have surrogates. We know who our father is. And so we know who our daddy is. We can come to his house. It's not Pastor Regis's house. This is God's house. Even though I'm a pastor, we all sons and daughters. We all sons and daughters. And God has marked your life. He's marked your life for greatness. I believe in Jesus' name that there are greater days ahead of you. But I pray that God is painting the picture of that greatness before you. Because if you don't change the image of what you've been looking at, you'll never change. You've got to change the picture of your life. Many of us, we're looking at a broken glass when our, when our life is marred and shattered. But the Holy Spirit want to come in and get all the fragmented pieces and bring it together to make it into a beautiful portrait. You can't take pieces of the picture and try to live it out. you got to get the whole picture and bring it together so you can see the story. Lennon Ravenhill said this. He said that the devil will always show us the beginning, but he'll never show you the ending. He'll always dangle the appearance of what it looked like to tempt you in, but once you get in, you may be too far in that you can't get out. If Adam and Eve really knew what it was going to cost them, they would have never, ever listened to the rubbish that Satan said about that fruit. So the question is for you today, what do you believe? Do you believe that when God said that the wages of sin is death? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that God has designated a, a time span in your life and my life to walk in greatness? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has great things for you? Happiness, joy, peace? Do you believe that? Because some of our lives uh, are, are marred with confusion, sickness, disease, chaos. It's all everywhere, all around us is chaos. We don't have any peace in our life. So guess what? A life absent of peace, I beg to differ that God might not be there. Because where God is, peace is there. So that means that in the midst of chaos, you can have peace because God is there. So if you're in a situation where things are chaotic and you don't have peace, you need to start examining and say, God ain't here because peace ain't here. Because wherever God is, peace is there. I pray in Jesus' name that you change your image. That you shall not be a church performer, but you shall be the church. 
that you shall not allow the spirit of religion to puppet you any longer, but you shall allow your relationship and your devotion to the creator to define who you are. I pray that your love for Jesus shall flow out of you like a well of life, that when people come around you that that fragrance of newness is released from you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would be prompt to change your ways, that every way that's in you that is a way of defilement that you shall detach from it and you shall allow the Lord to spiritually adjust who you are so that you can walk in the life and the light of what God called you to be and what God called you to do. We bless you now in Jesus' name that 2017 shall be marked as the greatest year that you've ever known personally, spiritually. That you would spiritually go to higher heights that you'll go to new levels in Christ, that you'll, you'll, you'll hit marks like the stock market right now is hitting markers right now, which I believe it's a reflection of where we're going. It's breaking barriers right now. And so as we see it break barriers, I pray you're breaking barriers in the spirit. I pray that you're soaring. You're soaring right now. I want you to see it right now. I want you to see it right now, that you're soaring. You're soaring in the spirit. God is bringing you up out of the dung hill. He's bringing you up out of the low place, and he's seen you on high. That your marriage shall be better in 2017 than it's ever been. That financially you'll be better than you've ever been because you honor God. That physically that you'll walk in divine health because God is for you, and the Word of God says in John, even as you prosper spiritually, I pray that your body prosper. We speak that over you in Jesus' name, that this is the year of redemption. It's the year of sword, but the year of redemption, that God shall redeem unto you and I those areas of your life that have been succumbed by the enemy. We bless you all in Jesus' name. May you go forth in the strength, the power, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And may you no longer, i got to say this again, May you no longer be imprisoned by the opinion of people. May you no longer be imprisoned by the opinion of people. May we shatter the prison bars of opinion. That the only thing that we shall be concerned about is what does God say? So when somebody says something to you, I want you to say, what did God say about it? What did God say about it? That's going to be your response from now. What does God, I got to see what God say about it. I can't give you an answer right now because I need to find out what God say about it. And once I find out what God say about it, then we can talk about it. God bless you all. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise, guys.